Hi, welcome back to What Did You Learn? I'm very excited to be here with a longtime colleague and friend, Donna Teach. Donna is the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at Nationwide Children's Hospital, one of the best. Oh, thank you. Hello. It's so great to have you. So, Donna, what did you do during the pandemic to distract yourself, get you know, what did you do after work or during work to make yourself feel better about how crazy it was? Oh my gosh. I think like everybody, we got small really fast, right? Our, our worlds got really small and a lot of things got outside of our control. So I think kind of living the serenity prayer every day, reminding yourself, I, I'm going to do what I can do. There's a lot of things I can't control right now. And then really seeking those little moments of happiness that you can find in the smallest thing. I think we've all learned that, that there's there's joy to be found in the small moments and um, just working through every day, like one day at a time. You just really, we've all had to do that. I have my Wonder Woman sticky here, right here that says one day at a time. Sometimes it's one hour at a time too, depending on which mm -hmm. you have. <laughs> so, if somebody had come to you sort of in January of 2020 and said, you can hit rewind on this year or no, and said, you know, what do you wish you had known about what was coming? Now, looking back on it, we're in December of 2020. So you really have like a, a long time to look back at it. What's the thing that you wish you had known? We had no idea the marathon we were about to embark on. I think I viewed this when we started and we had that quick, quick shutdown. And I think all of us were up, it was literally seven days a week for probably the first five weeks. Yeah. We viewed it as a sprint and I was living it as a sprint and my team was living it as a sprint. And I remember um, kind of hitting the wall and um, personally hitting the wall, seeing my team hit the wall. Um, and realizing we needed to breathe into what was going to be a marathon. And it's funny because I was looking at my calendar today and Q1 is like behavioral health opening, January, February, March. Then March is like my staff is going home and they're going to be back in, you know, two or three weeks. Right. And Q2, it's COVID. Q3, it's still COVID. So I think the advice um, and the importance of self-care when we're faced with things like this cannot be understated. Um, and just if I'd had any piece of advice, it was understanding the duration sport and we're still obviously living this period of time. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, sometime in July, I read a report by the CDC about what had happened to Americans' mental health. Like it just sort of plummeted, you know, and they showed the data and it said one of the things that, um, managers have to start doing is screening their employees and like asking very specific questions about like, how's your mental health? How are you doing? And I started doing that. And all of my people were like, ah, but you're the one who's having mental health issues. So we're doing great. But no, I, I mean, I think even for myself, it was really important to have some of those conversations and to say like, how are you doing? How are your kids doing? Like, no, really, how are you doing? You know, instead of just pretending like we were all just keep going, you know, nobody can go at that pace. So so that's yeah, yeah. no I was just gonna say at a time that it seems like because you know like I'm I'm working in the hospital every day the leadership team are here every day and I have a lot of my my um leaders in here um we figured out how to keep that safe and a lot of my essential folks but the mass majority of my team is working from home and um the technology and the, the challenges of the distance I think have actually brought us closer I think the deep um relationships that have been established and the support because um, everybody's kind of going on this journey on their own, but we're going on it together. And um, I think I've really gotten closer to my team um, than I ever was when we were in the office and family was like an outside thing. But now everybody's kids and dogs and yeah. family members and the happy times and the hard times. I mean, it's all on those video chats. Right. So um, I think if anything, it's brought us closer together, you know, yeah, um, I do. going through this time. There's an old saying that, you know, intimacy is born of conflict. And I think in this particular situation, we were all dealing with an outside conflict. So we had to like circle the wagons and sort of come closer and figure out how we were going to handle this thing together. Yeah. So let me ask you, because you're sitting at one of the best children's hospitals in the country, if not the world, and you're looking at the complete unknowns of children. And I remember early on talking to my father about this pandemic and him saying to me, can you imagine if it was flipped and this was killing children the way it was killing seniors? He's like, 
people would just like never leave their homes. What were you doing? What were your doctors and epidemiologists doing? Like what, how were you handling this whole thing? Just the social and mental stress of not knowing what this was going to do to children. Right. I think, you know, people have looked at the pandemic response as a whole. Kids have been lucky um, with the pandemic itself in terms of the volume of our hospitalization um, numbers and um, impact on children. They fared very well. However, as a system um, that cares for children, we had to go through the same levels of shutdown of our adult brethren, which meant kids who really relied on systems of care, whether that's primary care, or acute care. You know, we were shut down just like everybody else. We had to go to a complete tele you know, telemedicine model. And I think the other thing is that uh, we're in the business of clinical care. We're also in the business of addressing social determinants of children. Um, and so a lot of work with school-based health and a lot of the work in kids who are faced with disparity issues. And to understand, our, I remember our, our head of Columbus Public Schools here in Columbus, Ohio, talking about the fact that when they sent their kiddos home in March of last year, it was September and they still had not heard from 40% of their kids. So just the number of kids who've fallen through the gaps, like we've had to really aggressively follow up with our patients. You have a normal cadence of them coming in um, and supporting them face to face, but really transitioning that model of care to um, a video conferencing format, and then really trying to work um, short term um, with the systems of care that we have. And candidly, I think we have a lot of healing to do with our children. Um, I, you know, anyone who's a parent who's listening um, has seen firsthand the impact of loss for this generation, um, all the sacrifices they've had to make that we've never had to experience. And I think in our time of growing up, um, and I think the mental health impact that, you know, my institution, mental health is a huge initiative for us. And so I think seeing the long-term impact, we've got a lot of work we're going to need to do getting our kiddos to coming out of this. I think we're, we're realizing that's going to be a, a, you know, a multi-year effort just to really understand the depth of the impact this has had on our population, I think both adult and pediatric. Um, we still don't really understand the care impact in lots of chronically ill um, populations. You know, we're seeing rates going down. Like, ironically, things like prematurity rates were going down. Um, so we, we can't really explain why. So we've got a lot of, like, understanding of this period of time and how much of this people just not accessing care or what's behind that. But I, I think we're just beginning to peel um, the layers of beginning to understand. And, of course, you know, two days ago they gave the first vaccine. So how exciting is that? that yeah. I think we can all feel so hopeful um, I mean, we're a very small little community where we do very quaternary and tertiary medical care. We do research, we do teaching, we do all those things. And I will tell you, I think whether you're a, an academic organization like us or an adult academic organization or a community-based provider, there's definitely this dichotomy of work that we have to do, which is this balancing of the quaternary tertiary stuff that we need to do. But we definitely have got to be focused on care coordination and addressing social determinants. And I know we're going to talk about um, racial inequities right now, but if anything also that's come out of this time is the importance of realizing um, that racism has had a direct impact on public health. It is a leading public health issue. So I don't think, I think the times are past us as marketers where we can be like, we're just about brand, we're just about marketing, you know, but for patient care volume. And we're going to be in the business of supporting care coordination. Um, we're going to be in the business of helping our organizations figure out how to address social determinants of health and things that are far beyond the traditional four walls of our campus that as marketers we would traditionally be involved in. I mean, my, my job has transitioned dramatically in terms of the amount of legislative advocacy I'm involved in, the amount of fundraising I'm involved in. I think we're all going to see that as marketers. And I think the other thing that this has changed forever is the use of technologies and consumerism. You know, all the drums that we have been beating um, around the importance of technology and consumer access. I think those aspects of realizing you can deliver good quality of care um, telephonically and with video conferencing, I think we got to figure that out in the long run. And again, that can be used for both the higher end kind of like, I, I, it's going to be interesting to see. What percentage of that sort of like we were forced to take care of our more like acute and like chronically ill um, patients, what percentage of that returns? But this idea of using it for care coordination, primary care support, using texting, 
doing video conferencing, that stuff we're just beginning to realize and our docs are realizing what important tool that can be. So I think our jobs have never been more exciting. Um, I think they've also been never been more challenging in terms of thinking of defining the scope of a marketing and communications function. So um, I love everything you just said. I wish we could get on a bumper sticker. So I want to I want to break down a few parts of it because I, I think that <laughs> big bumper sticker. So so um okay. When you talk about the theme of what you just talked about is the pandemic pushed us to the place where as healthcare marketers, we could no longer say we would do it, but we said we have to do it and. Mm -hmm. That is the theme of what you just said. I want to take that theme and do, put it in two different areas. I want to talk about consumerism, but first I want to talk about that racial stuff because you're sitting there, you're the CMCO of a big, regardless of what you say, we're a small community. I mean, you're a big national children's hospital and Black Lives Matter happens and you're having internal employee discussions. You're thinking about social determinants of health. How did you wrap your head as a leader around what do we say first? Well, first, I just want to comment because I think this has been a um, personal journey. You know, um, I had no idea um, as someone who felt like they were pretty enlightened and um, not floating around with unconscious biases or white privilege. Um, this has been probably one of the most transformative personal parts of my journey um, in really listening to the stories of racism within my own organization, you know, um, and we posted about it. We took a strong stand. We hosted um, our own Black Lives Matter event here and a White Coats Matter, you know, um, uh, um, ceremony where we kneeled on our lawn for nine minutes and 30 seconds and we had more than 1,500 staff participating and we had to do it socially safely, you know, and safely yeah. distance. Anyway, so I think this personal journey, this seeing how my leadership team leaned into this and made bold and courageous moves empowered us as a marketing team. Um, we launched some immediate training. We launched unconscious bias training and we got a long journey to go. Again, this is gonna be a marathon, not a sprint, but I think that we all realized that we had this opportunity to fundamentally drive change and so many people live in fear that we're going to lose this moment. Um, and I think that's what fuels me is that we've all got to stay committed and in this. Um, and even with the elections past us and moving on, I mean, we just had a huge incident, sadly, of a, of a police shooting here in Columbus. And it brought it right back home again, you know, and, and brings it all right back home again. So I, I'm really motivated by having a purpose like that and an opportunity as a marketing and communications professional in healthcare to really help my organization transform um, around their opportunity to, to make change in this area. So can you tell I've got, I'm like, sorry. That no, your passion is so infectious. It's so great. This is what my audience wants to see. So, and my okay, team's, so my team's amp too. They're just really awesome. So my question to you is, do you think the momentum around the the the, the um, social stuff is so critical, but do you think you're going to be able to have the same momentum and convince the doctors and the infrastructure and the CEO and the CFO of how important it is to embrace this new way of doing care and this sort of consumer mentality around it? I think that, and I, I'm going to be really honest with you. I mean, we all know that healthcare is run rear third of the herd, right? Yeah, you know, you can do a mortgage online, you can book your trip, I mean, you can do everything online. And we know healthcare, because we've been allowed to do it, because we're MDs and PhDs, you know, we've been allowed to adopt slower. Now, that's not everyone in our industry, a lot have been very progressive. But even in pediatrics, we're the we're third of the third of the herd, because parents will jump through hoops to come to an academic children's hospital, yeah. you know, and we have not made things as easy for them as we could. And things are more complex. There's reasons for that in pediatrics, like you have family records. I mean, it is, there's a lot of things that present unique challenges. However, we've also known for a long time, this has never been a technology challenge. The technology has always been there. Epic has always had these things. We just need to turn them on. It's always been an operational challenge. And I think one of the biggest upsides of what's come through this time is that our care providers have been forced to adapt, right? And in the process of being forced to adapt in a good way, a lot of them, you know, um, uh, they're able to see the potential 
for what consumerism and digital technology can do to enhance care experience. Now, I think there's a lot we have to study to learn about what works and what doesn't, because I think there's going to be some aspects of care that we had to deliver this way. It may not be optimal in the long run, but there's a lot. Um, use of text messaging and that you can effectively communicate. Things like dealing with adolescents, like your daughter's story, the amount of openness that a child will have or an adolescent will have talking through a pad is amazing compared. So we're learning about all that. We're learning about things like behavioral health, that people can, there's actually a new dimension of talking through these screens that sometimes helps people open up. Donna, um, what's one tool you think that you learned from this experience? One tool that you either added to your toolbox or that you sharpened in your toolbox that you hope never to lose? Um, <laughs> except, and obviously, of course, for your momentum and your passion around these social justice issues. But what's, as a marketer and a communicator, yeah, your your team your your team and your staff are your heart. When it comes to anything in healthcare, I think the love and nurturing that my team put towards our frontline workers, um, realizing we launched a thing called the weekend in the middle of the pandemic, which had nothing to do with COVID. That was the rule. You cannot talk about anything about COVID. It was about surprise and delight. It was telling stories in the family. It was connecting you know, the 15,000 people who work here um, to support them um, and empower them. And so I think it just reinforced that um, our, our staff in our healthcare organizations are our heart. They're the hearts of the brand. And um, we're, we're very good at doing that. But I think this idea of never losing sight of that and how amazingly resilient the human spirit is to see these frontline workers who did not have a choice. Like, they were the most resilient of our team, you know? They didn't have a choice. They had to come here. They had to leave their kids. They had to leave their families. They had to put their health at jeopardy. And they came to it, tapped into that human resilience and spirit that brought them all into healthcare in the first place. And so as a marketer, sitting back and looking at that and realizing, man, how powerful in healthcare is that? And um, so I think that that's one of my big takeaways for my team too, is just um, nurturing and feeding your workforce as your most important audience when it comes to healthcare marketing. That's amazing. Donna, where's the best place that people can find you? I am on LinkedIn. Come and find me there. Um, uh, you can also email me, um, donna.teach at nationwidechildrens.org. Um, be patient with me if I don't get right back to you, but um, uh, you have a lot going on. <laughs> you can find me through Shizmed, you know, all the usual spots. Yeah, so. that's right. Thank you so much, Don. I really appreciate your time. Oh, I have. It's always so good to spend time with you. Thank you. Thank you.